Hello, friends. A warm welcome from the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. My name is Dimitri Lilkov, a senior research officer at the Martin Center, and it's a pleasure for me to moderate today's debate on the future of the AI Act. Before we, we, uh, we kick off, I just want to remind you that even though this is an online event, um, we uh, are re restarting our events in person. So if tomorrow you're in Brussels, join us maybe live uh, for a fantastic event on Ukraine and European defense policy. Now, back to AI. It's been a year since the European Commission unveiled its highly anticipated proposal for an artificial intelligence framework in Europe. The AI Act, as it's, um, as it's named, offers a legislative model for limiting the potentially risky applications of AI and providing democratic oversight of the rollout of these advanced technologies. In recent months, there has been much progress here in Brussels in improving the text and working towards its final version. Now, last week, the European Parliament Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age, the acronym is IDA, the IDA Committee concluded its own initiative report with the support of different political groups. This IDA report promotes a human-centric approach on AI, while also highlighting the benefits of these new technologies on different societal sectors, such as healthcare, sustainability, labor market, and overall competitiveness. In our event today, with our fantastic speakers, we want to present the most important takeaways from this European Parliament report, and also discuss the bigger picture about artificial intelligence usage and regulation in the European Union. And speaking about our experts today, I would like to present, first of all, uh, MEP Axel Foss, who is a member of the European Parliament, part of the EPP group. He has been uh, leading the work of the Special Committee on AI in the European Parliament. Um, joining us today as well is Mr. Wolfgang Ebner, Head of Digital Strategies and Innovation at the Austrian Federal Ministry for Digital and Economic Affairs. And last but not least, um, we will be joined hopefully by Mr. <laughs> Paul Nemitz, a Principal Advisor in the Director General for Justice at the European Commission. Hopefully Paul will join us shortly. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining our panel today. Final word to our audience, this is a live event, so be, please feel free to tweet, ask questions, uh, tag us, uh, follow, follow the discussion, and we'll have a specific Q&A session in the last 15 minutes of our event. So, without further ado, Axel, the floor is yours. Walk us through the IDA committee report and your work on that. So thank you, Dimitra, also for the um, introduction and uh, for your interest also on uh, AI and also on the AIDA report. So as you know, we finished our work in the AIDA report or will finish um, these then with the report in May with the vote in plenary. But uh, what we have to say here, and this is um, from my point of view, very important is at first do not underestimate AI. So, um, so AI is a kind of a booster for the digitalization and every single piece of our day by day life will be affected by these technology uh, change and, and development and the consequences for our competition and our wealth and our security is not or should not be underestimated. Um, but we, this shouldn't uh, concern us too much um, that we are only focusing at first only on the risk. No, we should more have the courage and uh, embracing these development and being part of it and trying also to be or to get a lead in it. But so you mentioned all these areas we focused also on in the report on the health sector, sustainability, competition, labor market, also military issues. So, and this is very important to get a kind of an impression um, how much affected these um, yeah, sectors might be in the future. 
And uh, once again, our political debate sometimes is more focusing on what might be risky instead of how we can use our chances and, and coming forward. And <clears throat> here, of course, what we are asking for at first is that we have these um, human-centered and trustworthy um, starting point for AI. Um, and, and we are starting with all these values, whatever this means, how we can implement these in practical issues at the end. This may be then part of the AI Act, but um, this should give us a kind of an um, yeah, idea that we can meet all these uh, risks, what we are thinking or might thinking of. Of course, what we do not like, totally do not like, is these social scoring, disinformation, and probably these um, automation weapons uh, without human control and, and something like this. But um, the level below, we have a lot of uh, AI implemented where we can set global standards with our European approach. But this chance to have a European approach to, to set global standards um, will not be come true if we are not leading in AI. And uh, therefore, we are definitely asking to, that we should be a part of all of these and um, that nobody should underestimate the strategic relevance of artificial intelligence. So you, you might say um, that everyone who is leading in AI, who is leading also the world, so that's why we have to have this in mind and we should move more forward with more courage. Um, the digitalization with innovation and developments and so should also take place in Europe. Um, and uh, otherwise we will end up as a kind of a digital colony. And uh, probably our values then will be um, yeah, contested by uh, yeah, regions in the world we do not like uh, or they do are they not sharing our values here. And this is the starting point of our report here and um, that we are also saying speed is one very core element we, we should more focus on. So we are too ponderous right now in the European Union with all our legislative ideas. We need to uh, step or to, to concentrate more that we are faster, that we are looking more forward, that we have to join our forces in Europe, probably thinking also more in this dimension in coming up with European uh, projects. And um, I would still think that it's not very wise that every member state has its own AI strategy, but not linking these to others. So um, I do not see how we can scale up with our digital industry if everyone is doing a little bit here and there and that we are not joining forces. And it might also not have um, kind of a best result if we are do not prioritizing on a European level where we would like to lead. Um, and then, of course, we need a kind of an executive plan um, with money, with infrastructure, with um, research, with talents and so on. And if we're getting all these, then we can play a kind of a very good role. So, um, what we are also mentioning is that we would like to see legislative acts only as a kind of a regulation any longer. Because we need a digital common market and therefore we can't allow any longer to fragment ourselves. That's why we, we are asking for only regulations. And of course, this regulation then should be flexible, technology neutral, uh, future orientated, appropriate and avoiding unnecessary bureaucracy, especially for startups and KMUs and research and so on. The second point is then 
that we should probably improve existing laws instead of having again and again and kind of a new law and then this might lead to legal uncertainties and overlapping issues so this is something where i would say we should avoid the fragmentation of uh, standards in, in technology, we should also avoid this one. And uh, probably also asking for the Commission and uh, the Parliament, um, ourselves here, um, that we are um, structuring our processes better, that we are not wasting time. So if we are coming to the AI Act, it took us seven months to decide what proper committee should handle this as a leading committee. So a second point, of course, is we need better access to data. And here we might come to a controversial situation that on the one hand side, and this has created a mentality of, um, of protection of personal data in a way that we might not um, give or, or provide quality data now to train uh, our algorithms. And this is a controversial issue. Um, so, and we have to solve this. This might be solved in a way in the AI Act that we can uh, probably install these sandboxes where we can have, have a kind of a, um, environment where you can train your algorithms and that uh, companies do not have to move to Africa or to somewhere else um, to train the algorithms. So uh, the third point, of course, um, we should, um, yeah, especially we should really focus on a digital single market. And here, of course, we have to convince the member states, especially, that even digital issues are affecting uh, civil law, for instance, then they should not say, oh, this is our competence and therefore we need, we, we do not want to have this solved on a European level. But in digital issues, this is a kind of a worldwide um, uh, issue. So that's why it doesn't make sense even thinking about in digital issues to fragment these Otherwise, we won't have a kind of a good start for our own European um, digital industry. Um, in addition, we need, and this is also focus, uh, as some are focusing in the report, we need the um, ecosystem of excellence. Um, what gives us the possibility that everyone has access to digital skills and uh, that we might have or create talents. Here we should have in mind that the US and also China are also already training in elementary school their um, young people. So, and, and this is what we do not, totally do not have in mind so far. And this has to be changed. Otherwise uh, we do not have the talents of, of building up a kind of a talent pool here, um, this should be uh, better at the end. Of course, we need a kind of a sustainable, robust digital infrastructure. Here again, some member states are totally too ponderous. Um, we, we need to come forward with this one. We need a kind of a, a strategy the industry uh, for, for, for the industry mm. with sustainable in, um, investments. Um, what is what what uh, yeah provide a kind of a um, support for startups and here regulatory sandboxes can also play a kind of a an important role and can also um, yeah improve the international cooperation here. Yeah, of course. At the end, when I'm referring to the um, AI Act, we need clear a kind of a clear regulation regarding the AI Act. This should not be a kind of a GDPR 2.0, where only at the end lawyers can uh, profit from. from. Uh, so that's why we need a kind of a very clear approach here, where we, we can also include a stronger cooperation, especially for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but also defense now in these days and the international 
cooperation. And this gives you a kind of an overview of what we have done in the AIDA report. And this should be a kind of a starting point, a strategic element where we are asking the Commission, but also the member states, especially, please come up with a plan, a concept and execute these and to put investments in it so that and, and prioritize something that we really can come forward as a European Union in a whole and uh, that we are not fragmenting ourselves in a way that we won't succeed. Thank you very much, Axel, for this for this opening expose. And in the meantime, we're joined by Paul Nimitz. Paul, thank you for, for, for joining us. Uh, before going uh, to Paul, I would like to give the floor to, to Wolfgang. Maybe he would give us uh, a national perspective on all of these issues. Mr. Ebner, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much and a warm welcome also from uh, from Vienna or near from Vienna as I'm uh, uh, at this time in my quarantine uh, at home and working from home. Um, uh, first of all, I would give you uh, a warm, warm greetings from a minister from Margarete Schrampek, who was unfortunately uh, her schedule did not give her the chance to to be with you today, and I I have the the honor to 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 represent our ministry and uh, give you some some thoughts on uh, on the development on and the deployment on artificial intelligence as well on the national level. But uh, and I think we will start and I will start with some some comments maybe on uh, on the European level. What is the core issue today of uh, of this meeting? Um, I really have to to highlight and also to to underline what 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 Axel Foss was uh, already saying uh, when he when he um, when he was he was talking about that artificial intelligence definitely is uh, when when there is when 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 we are talking about disruption then then artificial intelligence is the is the key element at the moment in digitalization. This is the core. Uh, the core technology that uh, uh, that, that that yeah that is the the, 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 the utmost utmost highlight in in, in digitalization at uh, at these times, and therefore we are very happy that uh, we we have an, uh, not only a European discussion but also a development of a framework uh, for for uh, for the development and also the usage of uh, of artificial intelligence um, uh, in on a European level. Um, I'm fully in line also with Axel, uh, uh, with uh, with Axel Foss, what he was what was he was talking about that we need an European framework for for artificial intelligence. But and this is one element I'm not hundred percent maybe in line is I think that the member states also need their own strategies. They need their national strategies. But and this I really have to highlight and our strategy is definitely in uh, uh, in 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 view of this goal is uh, within the European framework of course. All national strategies have to be within the European framework and also in the goal of the uh, of the needs and the challenges that are that are that are tackled within the EI Act. Just briefly coming to the to the uh, to the proposed regulation, we think that this is a a very good first step towards a clear but flexible legal framework for artificial intelligence that uh, pr promotes um, in innovation while ensuring a high level of protection and as well as, uh, as of security. We particularly welcome um, that for the first time, the, the red lines have been defined um, uh, for certain AI applications and certain practices for manipulation and mass surveillance. However, there are still detailed questions to be clarified, such as connection with the handling of biometric data for surveillance by security authorities. Axel Foss already mentioned also the, these, these issues uh, within uh, his statement. And thirdly, uh, as, a, as a first comment, trust in and transparency of artificial intelligence systems are crucial for acceptance in our point of view of this technology. The EU and as a body, as, as well as the member states, must continue to strengthen a human-centered approach to artificial intelligence. Priority must be given to a human oversight transparency as well as a traceability of AI systems. I just will stop here now as a first statement and I think we come uh, within the discussion to, to, uh, to further details. Thank you very much in, in advance. 
Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, and now we, we go to Paul. Uh, Paul, you've been very vocal in your work about the impact uh, and, and the future of democracy in the age of artificial intelligence. So I look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much. Yes, first of all, <clears throat> congratulations uh, uh, to Axel Voss for, for the report. I think it is very, very important that democracy charges itself um, uh, uh, of dealing with, uh, with these uh, um, uh, very powerful new uh, disrupting technologies. And um, I would also say that, you know, the Commission strategy is, of course, on three pillars. Uh, first, we want to be really good in artificial intelligence development, uh, research and take up in Europe. Second, we want to get our workforce ready for this. We need qualified uh, people. Um, uh, we need new professors, but also lifelong learning. And third, we need the rules which allow people to have trust uh, in this new technology. These are the three pillars of the European strategy. And I think uh, the report reflects these and gives them, let's say, uh, flesh and color here and there. Um, and that is for me, uh, let's say, the most important thing that we move from ethics talk to real legislation, to binding rules which bring an internal market with a level playing field, because that is the difference to ethics rules. Ethics are voluntary and, you know, some play and some don't, and then you don't have a level playing field. If we do legislation, we are sure that we will not have a fragmented uh, market in Europe uh, where some member states do legislation, some don't, some go with ethics, some don't, but we have one set of rules for all in Europe. And second, we have the democratic process doing this. So these rules have democratic legitimacy with Axel Foss and other members of parliament deliberating and also getting into this subject. I think that's, that's also a really good sign that our parliamentarians in Europe get into this very complicated material, but which is crucial for the functioning of democracy. And third, um, these rules are rules which can be enforced and will be taken serious. And so I would just say that the call for clear rules, but which have, at the same time have to be flexible. I have heard that call so often. And I would say, um, you know, as usual, Let's try to reach both goals, but there is, of course, a tension between the clarity today and the openness for future development of these rules in a double sense, uh, um, uh, namely, if we want the rules on the one hand not to stop innovation in the future, not to be an obstacle to innovation, but rather to be flexible enough that they also make sense when uh, the technology moves on. We need to have the formulations in a way which I would call, um, you know, technology neutral. One could also call it, you know, don't use the buzzwords of the day so that these rules can be reinterpreted in the future and still have a meaning. And um, that's, I think, what is good legislation about uh, rather than being caught by the buzzwords of the day. Um, and uh, and becoming, uh, let's say, a too prescriptive um, uh, innovation obstacle. So we have to find the right balance between, and I think the proposal of the Commission, uh, which was very hard work, you will remember Mrs. von der Leyen uh, um, said that the Commission will present within 100 days from taking office the new proposal. It has taken a little bit longer, but I think it is a good um, uh, basis for negotiations, and I now look forward also on the basis of the report of Axel Foss and the AIDA Group um, to move forward uh, uh, with this proposal. Thank you for your opening uh, statements. Now I would like to, before we go to Q&A with the, with the audience and also dear viewers, uh, feel free to ask questions online. I see that there's, uh, there's many viewers uh, presently. I just want to individually come back to, to some of our speakers right now and to to uh, follow up on, on some of the things which have been mentioned. Um, and Axel, in your opening statement, you mentioned the, 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 your fear about the EU becoming a digital colony. Now, could you elaborate a bit more on this? Do you have in mind China? Do you have in mind the US? Is it about data? Is it about competitiveness? Give us some context. <laughs> so um, I'm fearing a little bit, or I'm, I'm very uh, concerned that our mentality is 
also because of the GDP are more directed in this direction of protection. And uh, that we are not um, uh, thinking about to, uh, to de develop and, and to, to innovate and, and so on, because we have all or some problems with doing these and that and, and so on. And that's why we are not fast enough. There is no speed in, in all our um, legislation and, and uh, developments and so on, that we can really have the impression that we are leading or be a kind of a co-leader in AI. And, um, and, and here, once again, if we are, do not provide quality data to train algorithms, then we are out of the game. And uh, this is something I'm, I'm fearing a bit that um, because of these ponderous proceedings, because of this non-existing concept and plan and non-execution of these in a kind of a very um, fast uh, way or also not joining forces this gives up us not the strength that we might lead at the end and so because then we are missing some developments then we will be in the third fourth fifth place or whatever and then again um yeah we will dependent on other regions they will lead they have a lot of data they can train, they can innovate, etc., and they will come first. They will be a kind of a new monopoly then, and everyone then is um, yeah, looking at these and saying, oh, why we do have to do this again and again? No, then we will be consumer, but we do not will be a leading uh, power <laughs> for, for this whole situation. And this is what I'm fearing, what I'm concerned about, and uh, so far, I would say, yes, we are doing our regulation, but I'm totally missing a strategic plan, how to become a kind of a leader of AI. This can't be done by only regulation. This has to be guided or, or to, to be lead. Um, also with executive plans, priorities, strategic uh, thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I'm totally missing. Yeah, you've been quite emphatic on, on, on this point. And here I would like to jump directly to Paul, uh, because here you mentioned the importance of, of protecting European interests. But um, Paul, I'm reminded uh, of your um, really interesting and ambitious uh, manifesto you were part of last year in defense of democracy and the rule of law in the age of artificial intelligence. And there you talk a lot about the importance of fundamental rights and safeguarding these fundamental rights in the age of AI. So how, how do these two things shape together? Competitiveness, protection of fundamental rights. Is there a clash? Where do you stand? Microphone, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't think there is a clash. And I would like to call into the witness stand uh, the companies like Apple and Microsoft, the most uh, successful digital companies of the world, all of which say that they give their customers uh, worldwide GDPR standards and data protection and even more than that if you think of uh, the encryption uh, um, uh, uh, efforts of Apple and so on. So I think it's a boogeyman uh, to make um, uh, up this uh, story of, oh my God, you know, we are, uh, we are too negative, we are too defensive. The reality is Americans, people in America, are as worried about what happens to their personal data <laughs> as are Europeans. And, uh, you know, the problem is that the American political system is failing them. Um, and there's nothing better uh, uh, for the people in America without a good data protection. And there's certainly less trust. For example, if you look at, let's just take the sector of education, you know, where Bill Gates tried to set up a fantastic system called In Bloom. Uh, which was from the academic side certainly totally positive for the American education system. It failed because the parents didn't believe uh, that Bill Gates would treat the data properly because they didn't have a law. They just don't believe the promise of a businessman. And that's a problem we don't have in Europe now. So I would say let's not do two mistakes. 
let's not talk down the law generally as an obstacle to innovation and so on, because if we mean it with democracy and we live in a crisis democracy, in, of democracy and we have a war against democracy in Europe now uh, uh, with, with Putin, uh, the dictator, uh, doing war on the Ukraine, if we mean it with democracy, we cannot talk down the most noble instrument of democracy, which is the law. But also, I would say, let's not talk down the laws which have been adopted and which work well. GDPR is a trust booster for our companies which are selling their services worldwide. Because take a startup from Europe, which has no mark recognition, which is not known, and which wants to sell services to people in Europe and outside Europe. It has one huge advantage. It can tell its customers, look, you don't only have to believe my promise or our promise that we are a good company and we will treat your data properly. No, we are held by law to treat the data properly. And there are many companies who make a business case out of this, American companies, they pay their data protection officer out of the marketing budget. And I think rather than mourning about all the bad things in Europe and Germans, you know, I'm a German myself, you know, we like to mourn about what's wrong in Germany and so on. Let's recognize Berlin is now the startup capital of Europe. It has overtaken London. It is simply not true that we are behind everywhere. I can tell you, I was a member of the German Data Ethics Commission where we had the president of the German Institute of AI. The reality is that in some com consumer markets like Levi's jeans and Kellogg's conflicts in the 70s and Opel and Ford, the cars, you know, which came from America in the consumer market, America was always great. Today in the digital markets, in the consumer markets, America is great. This is international division of labor. But <laughs> in other digital markets, Europe is very strong. And I would also say to Axel Force, we have a very strategic approach in the European Commission. We have a very good cooperation with the member states, for example, on the digital strategies. We have exactly this system that we have a European strategy and member states fill this strategy with their own plans. And I would say, generally speaking, the European Parliament and the European Commission and the Council, so the European institutions are probably in terms of bringing forward both a policy for digital which is growth oriented, but which is also oriented to building the trust of the people in this new techno economic structure. We are world leaders because let's be honest in America, nothing is happening on the political level in this direction and China. Yeah, sure. In China, things go faster, but in a direction of total dictatorship, then the social scoring. If you are urgently wanting to have this, you know, please go to China. So I don't think that either the United States or China are models for us. And I'm actually also, when it comes to the economics, not so pessimistic. We are even recruiting back top um, foreign um, academics back to Europe. I will give you one example. Um, Iyad Ravan, head of the Max Planck Institute in Berlin on education, is a former, is an Iranian, but he's a MIT professor. He's one of the most worldwide recognized uh, uh, important professors on, um, in mathematics on how AI for, uh, works, and he is now in Berlin. So, you know, all these stories about brain drain and all our companies go elsewhere and so on. I mean, there's a lot of boogeyman talk in this. The reality is that we are very, very um, uh, innovative economies. The last example, of course, was the COVID vaccines, which we innovated, by the way, also with help of AI. And so I would say, let's talk about our successes. Let's talk about where we are strong. Let's face these issues with self-confidence rather than talking down European achievements, including the achievement of GDPR. A, a, a very strong defense about European competitiveness and GDPR. Axel, a quick, quick reflection and quick uh, reaction. <laughs> so it, it, it can't be quick at the end, but uh, this is uh, such a stereotype behavior of the commission. The world is wonderful. We are fantastic. We do not make faults. There's no mistake. No GDPR is a religion. We are going forward. And this is what I'm meaning. We have a lot of problems in GDPR. I listed them all, but nobody is interested because of less courage in improving the whole situation. And where, please, Paul, tell me 
where are the companies who can compete globally um, with I, I do not see listed in in the stock exchanges our companies who are doing so wonderful um, that we can say oh yes we can proud of it no i can't see it and the point is what i'm saying now we gdpr is a core instrument but we have to link these with the developments with upcoming developments and nobody is doing this we are just saying oh no 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 we have to protect gdpr and nothing else and then we are not fast enough we can have a kind of a share in the market if we are creating these values and the speed together and being um, on, on top of these development. But this is not what is happening. And I do not see where you get your information just hiring someone from a good guy to Berlin doesn't mean that we are making business models out of it. I can't see it so far. And this means wealth and uh, yeah, social security at the end. And, and this is something what I'm totally missing. What are our priorities in AI? Please say, I, I would be happy if you can say, oh yes, this is, uh, we should focus on AI, on self-driving cars or uh, quantum computing or 3D printing, whatever it is. I do not have seen any priorities of the commission and then saying, oh yes, and we are giving this money to implement all these and execute these what our plans are. I do not see this strategy. Just saying, oh yes, we have to deal here with some um, regulations and so on. This is not a surviving strategy in this area. No, nothing beats uh, a good clash between the European Parliament and the European Commission, I must say, I must say. Wolfgang, cool us off a bit. Uh, where, where do you stand on these issues and maybe Introduce a national perspective a bit. Even, um, a couple of minutes ago, even uh, Axel Foss mentioned that he, he does not want to see uh, member states developing their own artificial intelligence strategies. Maybe reflect on this and, and where do you stand with all this, this uh, passionate debate? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I can, can, can also uh, only underline what you already said. It's very interesting when the European Parliament is in a deep discussion with, with the European Commission. It's, it's quite fruitful. Um, you, you, you were talking about uh, yeah, the, the, the high expectations on artificial intelligence in Europe, uh, as well as uh, where we are standing, uh, also on, on, a, on, a, on a national level. Um, let, let me say there in... in um, Principally in, in, principally, in our opinion, the European approach of using artificial intelligence in uh, a human-centered way and for the common good, while at the same time, and this is very important, uh, promoting competitiveness and innovation uh, is definitely the right approach um, to position Europe well in the global competition of innovative technologies and especially artificial um, in, intelligence. Uh, and with the, the world's first regulatory framework, and that's where we, we really can, can be proud of, I think, for artificial intelligence, Europe is setting out new rules and measures uh, with the aim of making it a global center for a trustworthy artificial intelligence. And as you already mentioned, maybe uh, as to, to give you some some, some in uh, on, our, on our own strategy, because I already mentioned the strategy in the beginning. Well, we, the Austrian government, we um, published our national AI strategy in August of last year. And uh, thus, in, we establish a frame, uh, the framework conditions for a prosperous and responsible use of artificial intelligence in all areas of life. But definitely, as already mentioned uh, before in my first statement, the Austrian AI strategy is not only interdisciplinary and participatory, but above all, European. Uh, and therefore, I really want to highlight that our Austrian strategy is already closely towards the two pillars that, are, uh, that have been already mentioned also of the European AI strategy. So the one side, the ecosystem for trust, and on the other side, the ecosystem for excellence. And therefore, applies these to the future use of artificial intelligence in Austria. We are also designing our national AI ecosystems in harmony with 
50 European objectives. So therefore, we are really all our um, the discussion as well as all, all our developments on, on our, not, not only our legal framework, but also our strategic point of view is definitely in the light and in line with the European principles on the one side and also the European vision and goals of a strategic on a on a strategic level. As I've been also a member, been a member of the uh, of the high level group for artificial intelligence for the strategy that was developed in the last years. And as well, we are also now in a close cooperation with the European Parliament, but also with the European Commission and with our friends in the Council on uh, the development of the EI uh, legal act that is that, uh, that we are talking about at the moment. Mm -hmm. We are starting to receive questions from the audience, so I would like to uh, pose two of these questions and in the end, I hope we have enough time to come back to our to our discussion, interinstitutional discussion. First question is uh, from uh, Julien Bourgeois. Um, the UK, and I think this is posed for everybody, feel free to pick up on it uh, in a bit. Uh, the question is the following. The UK has started working on its artificial intelligence strategy and might privilege a more liberal approach. Do you foresee discrepancy with the EU? Maybe do we foresee any clashes uh, on, on this front? This is a question for, for all of the speakers. And the second question, which is specific to, to Mr. Foss, uh, given the cross-border impact of a lot of AI systems, should there be a more solid cooperation mechanism at the EU level, for example, through the proposed AI board? So maybe, uh, Mr. Foss, you'd like to start with the personal question, and then we can discuss whether the UK's regime on AI might cause us some trouble. <laughs> yes, so I would uh, pretty much prefer a kind of a solid uh, mechanism in, in each direction. So um, that we are joining European forces, so the member states uh, should act together, that we should have a kind of a, a European project also, where we can also have our, our joining. And if this is a kind of a priority at the end, then that we should focus on these and, and make these to a kind of a leadership in this area. And also the kind of mechanism in um, oversight, um, what what might be a kind of a controversial issue right now in which direction this should go, if we should have a kind of an additional EU agency or if this is strengthening more the national um, structures or so on. This might be discussed, but in the parliament we are asking, I think in three, four or whatever um, different uh, legal tools for oversight and also in different directions and there should be also a kind of a concept behind how we should move forward to this. But um, I would um, rather prefer now in concentrating on some uh, priorities and saying here we would like to lead. So if just, for instance, if cars are so important for Europe, why we do not have the priority in saying we would like to lead the self-driving car and then joining forces, investments, etc., doing the research and whatever it's necessary, but concentrating on something so that we can also play a leading role here. And uh, so, and, and this would be my idea or approach to it, um, because I can't see if we are not joining forces that we might scale up and, and be a kind of a serious competitor to others who are flexible and who have a lot of money in place and uh, this is what we can't provide really right now in this um, in, in our fragmented situation and this is where i would suggest yeah a solid mechanism would be good thank you very much um wolfgang any thoughts <laughs> on the uk's and its potential less stringent more liberal approach to to, to this this question mm -hmm. I think I, I just want to give a, a, a short statement because some some points are, have been already mentioned by Atl Foss. Uh, I think that, and I hope the, the translation that I'm uh, giving you now is is the right one. Uh, the, the major issue, the major goal of our strategy for artificial intelligence in Austria was from the beginning uh, as less as possible 
as much as needed. So really to keep the, the utmost of liberality for, for the development of artificial intelligence in specifically, uh, uh, f but on a, on, a, on, a, on a legal certain level. Therefore, um, I, I really want to, so that this, this was our, uh, our major goal because, and this was already mentioned also by the, by the previous speakers by both of, uh, of you, uh, that when 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 looking on the on the world, you have Europe in the middle, and you have on the left side as well as on the right side. I don't, don't mean that politically, only geographically. There are developments in a in a totally different framework, and they are much faster than in Europe maybe. But what is our um, major added value, I think, is the legal certainty. What, what, what we are doing now with the legal act as well as with uh, with our strategies. It really means strategies because we have not only one strategy because we have several strategies uh, um, uh, uh, giving one hand to the uh, to the other. And just a, um, a last remark, I really also want to to highlight the, the need, and we we also talking about on a on a national level very intensively about that is a legal framework for regulatory sandboxes. I think that also with a legal certainty for. Um, the, 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 not the development, but the, the offer to, to, to give some space for innovation in form of regulatory sandboxes on a, on a, on a, on a legal certain level. I think this is, this is a, a quite a crucial issue for all of us. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you. Um, Paul, moving, moving to you, uh, maybe the question on, on the UK and it's, it, it's standard and also a follow up from me uh, personally to you, Paul. How do we make sure that we we make the AI Act or European standards a global standard? How do we make sure that it's attractive model for other international partners? How do we do we positively export this? I know it's a big question, but maybe thoughts on this. Well, um, I I would say first of all, just uh, to comfort Axel, I, I I'm totally with him uh, on his requests on priorities. But the reality is, the Commission has already presented not only. And the European Council has already discussed this, and there's a progress report of April of last year, which sets out all the priorities on AI, how Europe is going to become the leader in AI, and also the sectors. For example, if Axel says, you know, we should make uh, mobility uh, one of the key sectors, we have a whole chapter uh, in this report to build how we build strategic leadership in high impact sectors, and one of the sectors is indeed uh, that we want to make mobility smarter, safer, and more sustainable through AI. And uh, so, you know, let's not talk down our own achievements, including the achievements of EU institutions. And by the way, there's a reason why Tesla builds its biggest factory, uh, which has started to produce just and was just opened by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, uh, near Berlin in Germany. Uh, and the reason is the competence of Europeans in building these AI vehicles. Um, you know, and the same uh, is the reason why Intel is now building its newest mega factory in Europe. So, you know, I think if we want to do something good for our economy and for growth and for innovation in Europe, we cannot talk down Europe all the time. We have to talk about our successes and excuse me if I do it as a commission official, I'm proud about the achievements of the European economy. And if I read, talking now about the UK, that Berlin is overtaking London as a startup capital, you know, I'm happy to say it because that shows that it's a boogeyman to say everything is bad here. And so, I mean, if we talk too much like that, may, some people may believe it and invest in the UK because we are talking like this. So uh, to be clear, we don't want to conquer the world, neither with GDPR nor with our AI Act. We want to make sure that our economy works well and that our people here in Europe get what the Charter of Fundamental Rights protect, uh, uh, promises. And by the way, it's the Charter which promises uh, the fundamental rights protection of personal data. Uh, and it was German President Roman Herzog as the president of the convention which did the Charter, which brought this article into the Charter. So. <clears throat> Uh, there is nothing uh, uh, bad about this. This is a great achievement of civilization, and I think we're doing well with it. And with the AI Act, um, you know, what I have just heard yesterday again, um, I was at a big tech conference on AI, and I think what investors and companies want is legal certainty. And this is what they're getting first in Europe, 
if this law is not so wishy-washy and so flexible that in the end nobody understands anymore what it means. And there I join Axel too. And I would just say on GDPR, you know, we had a lot of work, and I don't want to mention names, of members of parliament and of lobbyists to make sure that GDPR is wishy-washy. And, you know, I can only say, you know, can't have the cake and eat it. If you want to have a clear law, the commission is the first one to deliver. But then in the political process, if people start, you know, making wishy-washy formulations and so on, well, the costs afterwards are borne by SMEs. Because it's true on some parts of GDPR, you know, because it is so much only about the accountability of companies and so non-descriptive and non-prescriptive that it's only possible to apply it, you know, if you have a consultant or lawyer. I regret that. The, the commission proposal was certainty, certainly on, on these parts much clearer. And so I join Axel in this. If we want to bring down the costs of compliance, we have to also have the guts to make a law which means something and where you, you, know, you, don't, you don't need much more than a dictionary to understand what it means. Yeah? And that sometimes requires the legislator also to be, uh, you know, a little bit more clear and a little bit more prescriptive. And I think it's possible to do this while still staying open to the future and being technolo technologically neutral. If things work well, I think the AI Act already is inspiring many, but that's not our ambition. We legislate for the economy of Europe and we legislate for the people of Europe in Brussels and um, let's say, always having in mind the international ramifications. And the key issue here is that through European legislation, we only reach a level playing field in Europe if we make it clear in the legislation that, of course, this legislation applies absolutely also to any player which brings AI into the um, common market from the outside, like GDPR applies to all players who come from the outside. That, of course, is one provision where I would say, you know, let's be very clear in these provisions and not wishy-washy. Okay, thank you very much. Very quickly, Wolfgang, Axel, do you see a risk that the AI Act, Act is going to become wishy-washy and there's going to be major loopholes in it when it comes to implementation? That's an important question. Yes, it is. Um, I, I think we are in, in the parliament are very famous for uh, making wishy-washy uh, uh, situations um, because of the compromises we have to have um, to come politically forward. Here, of course, we need a kind of a very self-confident commission and a very strong uh, council in saying and, and correcting probably some of our uh, goals, but um, our, our compromises. But um, so far, what I'm hearing so far is not giving me confidence that this is a kind of a legal tool at the end where we are saying, oh, yes, now we are becoming a kind of a leading force in AI. So, we, of course, we have to wait till the very end, but um, so far, um, I'm, I'm not too confident right now, it, but this is the reason why um, in, in the parliament we have yeah, different or let's say seven different approaches uh, of the political groups and we have to have uh, find compromises and then we are out a little bit probably of a kind of a certainty of, of the law. But let's wait. Here we have to wait. Oh, you disappeared. So, can you hear me? Hmm? I'm here. I'm here. Um, I, 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 uh, do you see the no, document? Made, I think. Do you see? I've, I've just put up the coordinated plan on artificial intelligence 2021 review. Do you see it? Yes, we, we yeah. see yes. it. Yes. Okay. Now, Dimitar is. Fiddling in my screen, I don't know what he's doing. 
Anyway, Dimitar, you can take it off again. I mean, this is a document which shows you that maybe we are further than you think. Uh, please have a look yeah, at it. But, but may I add something? Sorry, sorry there was a technical glitch. Uh, at a certain point, the presentation appeared. Uh, Paul, if you'd be so kind to uh, to switch it off, because we need to close the debate. OK. Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, um, Axel, you have a you have a point. I saw it, you yes, it, it was just a, kind of a short point in a way. But um, if we need data, and um, so we have the GDPR in place, and now we are starting to circumvent with other legal tools the GDPR because we do not have enough data, and especially not quality data, with the Data Governance Act, with the Data Act, and so on, and and this. I can't see this anywhere else in the world where we have to motivate um, sharing data because all the others have already a lot of data. And this is why I think if we are not uh, proceeding here faster and if we are not coming forward and, and changing of mindset, I do not see that we will be leading these. I do not see that we will um, be a kind of a leading a uh, developer of something here we need to be more faster and not that ponderous and we need an execution plan and not only uh, creating ideas we, we need to come forward also practical this is what i'm meaning and um, I'm, I'm trying not to talk down something i try more to motivate to improve everything and this is uh, what i'm missing uh, we have lots of questions from the audience. I'll uh, take the liberty to extend the debate by five minutes or so, and I'll quickly ask for two more questions, uh, which are uh, for our, our experts. Jakob Huga asks the following. How do the participants assess the quality of the draft regulation, in particular when it comes to preventing dis discrimination? Is there, don't we need a clearer specification on AI fairness here? So discrimination and fairness, this is question number one. And uh, question number two from Jakovina uh, Kindilidi is, do you think that the current sandbox model, especially when we talk about liability, is this sandbox model sufficient to boost innovation and to counterbalance the compliance costs for EU startups and SMEs? Uh, Wolfgang uh, had a point about, about sandbox, maybe he wants to take it up. But yes, gentlemen, fairness, discrimination, do we need stronger language here? And our sandbox is going to help us and make sure that compliance costs go down. Floor is the floor is open for responses. Okay, maybe. maybe um, uh, as... Sorry. <clears throat> go ahead. Uh, maybe a short, uh, a short remark um, uh, on the on the on the first point. Uh, um, uh, I think that, uh, as it was already mentioned by, by all of us, uh, that we are the, the, the first in the world, Europe is the first in the world who has a legal framework for artificial intelligence in place or in development. So therefore, I think uh, uh, that, that the question and with the, the key element of the human-centered uh, or the human-centric approach of artificial intelligence uh, we, 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 I think we have, uh, we have a quite good basis for, for, uh, for, for the legal certainty. Um, just, just coming to the, to the regulatory uh, sandboxes, I think also, and this is, this is also in line with my, with my first remark, um, I don't uh, know any other uh, region, to be honest, on the, uh, where we have uh, the real, the, 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 the approach of legal certainty also for the development uh, of innovation within uh, regulatory sandboxes in uh, that specific way, like, like in Europe. So I'm quite confident that we are, that we are with, uh, with trust and, uh, and with safety on a real uh, good track in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul Axel. Concluding thoughts on these questions? Well, I would say um, the uh, artificial intelligence, wherever it carries out functions which otherwise humans would have carried out, needs to comply with all laws. So it's certainly, um, you know, we have a big a key on non-discrimination in EU European law, and I don't know whether we need to repeat all this in the AI Act. It, it must be understood that the other law also on consumer protection, for example, and non-discrimination, which we have in the EU, of course, also applies to these systems. On the sandbox, I would say 
you know, let's not construct a law for a boogeyman. The claim that this or that cannot be done in Europe because of GDPR and this new, these claims are completely overdone. There are huge openings in GDPR for research, for health, and so on. And um, I'm, you know, I think the Commission has made a very measured proposal for a sandbox because, of course, a sandbox cannot mean at the end that companies can do anything, you know, at the danger and at the cost of hurting individuals, for example. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it is the job of the Commission, previously called, uh, you know, uh, the Commission of the European Economic Community. After all, you know, the, the, the Commission is a very economically oriented body. Um, to make sure that growth and innovation thrives in uh, Europe. The lead DG on this uh, proposal is DG Connect, which has this job as the core. It's the industry commissioner uh, who has proposed this uh, uh, um, uh, instrument. And I would say the proposal on the sandbox has exactly this intention and serves this purpose and is a really good start for negotiations. But I'm also convinced, like on GDPR, that because we are dealing with cutting edge issues here, the negotiations in the council and in the parliament are not only about positions you know it's not the national position on this and no it's a finding process to come to the best rule which we can give ourselves and that's also my invitation to members of parliament and also to representatives of member states please contribute to this finding process rather than digging in into so-called national positions which in this global economy you know i think are not so relevant anymore. I mean, you know, it's it's very it's it probably is quite ridiculous to say we have a national position here, because there will be so many different players, so many different interests in every member state. And the challenge for all of us is, with this cutting edge new technology, to do cutting edge law which makes sense. And so I would say it would be great if the negotiations in the council and the parliament are a finding process, and if we all struggle for the best result for Europe in terms of growth, in terms of innovation, in terms of sustainability, and in terms of fundamental rights and well-functioning democracy, rather than digging in positions. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Axel, concluding thoughts, or if you want to reference these, uh, these questions we just had. <laughs> yes, thank you. So um, on AI, of course, we have a kind of a long wish list in non that AI shouldn't be non biased and non discriminatory and gender balance and so on. And uh, so I do not uh, fear that we, we are missing here something. And as Paul said, yes, we have already a lot implemented. And uh, probably it's not really necessary to uh, repeat this all the time. But um, of course, we, we know this and, and we have this in mind, and this should also play a kind of a role. But I wouldn't be less concerned if a democratic legislator could be more acting flexible. What we are seeing with the GDPR is, or oh, we have decided in 2016, it's enforced in, in since 2018, but we see a lot of problems, but no courage, no will in improving the situation. It doesn't mean that the GDPR is bad, but there is no will in improving. We are seeing problems and nobody will improve these. And this is what I'm a little bit concerned also in the AI Act that we are doing again, here's something and saying, oh, this has to last for the next five years. I don't care if there are some problems. No, we should find a way forward in correcting and improving the situation as soon as we are seeing a kind of a problem. And uh, so I, I would wish for this flexible legislator and the courage of a um, democratic legislator instead of just saying we are wonderful. Great. Thank you very much for this exciting discussion. We're really running over mm -hmm. time. And even if I want, there are so many takeaways that I cannot crunch in a minute. Maybe a second of self-promotion. And just to say to our audience, if you're more interested on these questions, check out our Martin Center Brussels Bytes podcast. You can listen to our recording with MEP Axel Foss from last year on uh, digital sovereignty. You can also listen to our pilot podcast with Paul Nemitz with whom we spoke about democracy in the age of artificial intelligence. 
So you can you can uh, listen to these recordings for a bit more information on that. Uh, Wolfgang Ebner, Axel Voss, uh, Paul Nemitz, thank you very much for, for joining us today. We had lots of questions from the audience. I hope it was exciting for, for our viewers as well. Wishing you a great afternoon and hopefully see you and our audience in person real soon. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye to all. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you.